Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2016 premiere auction. And I'm really excited about this one because it's a very unusual gun. This is a semi-automatic, sort of prototype, Mauser sporting rifle. Now, Paul Mauser, one of the two very famous Mauser brothers, uh, spent like 15 years really trying to get a military compatible or military grade semi-automatic rifle designed and he just wasn't ever quite able to do it. He came up with something like 17 different uh, rifle designs, different actions, a whole wide variety of different locking mechanisms, all sorts of, of things, uh, but never quite got one good enough for standard issue military use. Uh, he, in fact, even lost his uh, right eye in the process. Uh, he had an, an accident in 1901 uh, where one of the rifles had some, some oopsies and uh, a, a fragment of rifle destroyed his eye. So he actually had a, a fake glass eye after that. At any rate, this is not the gun that caused that. Um, in the, the most successful version that he was able to come up with was actually adopted by the German military as the model of 1915 or 1916. Um, used in very small numbers by the infantry, just a couple hundred were made, used in slightly larger numbers, again a couple hundred, uh, by aircraft troops, uh, both airplanes and zeppelin troops, uh, guys who needed, uh, where, guys where the semi-automatic capacity of a rifle, where you didn't have to be manipulating the gun to shoot, was very helpful because of course they were doing things like trying not to fall out of aircraft, uh, and where you weren't in any likelihood of getting mud or dirt or gunk into the gun. Uh, aircraft use was a pretty sterile place to be running semi-automatic rifles. Anyway, that project, that rifle, began life sort of as the Mauser 0608 pistol. Now I've done a video before on one of those, so you can check that out if you'd like the background context. When Mauser transitioned that into the rifle, he did so in 1909. He had a model of 1909 rifle. That model was kind of updated into this, which is a patent date of 1913. In fact, it has a big old Mauser patent, 1913 engraving on the side. And it was this rifle that was then adopted two years later by the German military, again, in very limited numbers, not the full standard issue that Mauser had really been hoping for. Of course, at that point, 1915, Mauser has died, so he never lived to actually see that happen. Now, what's interesting about this particular one is, unlike the military rifles, this is a sporting rifle. Um, Mauser was really looking for the military market, but when he had guns that were good enough to function, just not quite rugged enough for military use, the Mauser company was perfectly willing to manufacture and sell those on the sporting market. So this particular one is actually in a 9mm cartridge, I believe 9 by 57 but don't quote me on that. Um, it has this, this full, uh, full length stock, full length upper handguard, it's got a cheek rest on this side of the rear stock, and it's set uh, with a scope rail actually on the receiver. Now this is serial num number 156. I don't know where the number started. However, I am also aware of serial number 152, which is the exact same mechanism. It's also a, a 1913 patent dated rifle. But interestingly, that one actually has a cut down, a very, well not cut down, a sporter stock, short from the factory, no upper handguard, uh, an octagonal barrel and a different configuration of front sight. Interesting, they share the exact same receiver and the exact same mechanism, but two different manufacturer styles. So clearly these were being made in small numbers, probably special order, and uh, you could get whatever pattern you wanted from Mauser. This would have been a pretty darn expensive, high-end, fancy rifle at the time. There weren't a lot of full power locked breech semi-auto rifles floating around at that point. So this, now I've already done a video on the infantry model of this that was used very briefly by the German military, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but I will go over the basic operation and we'll look on the inside, because that's just cool enough that I want to do it again. So there's an interesting, weird question to this rifle, which is, the bolt here is marked 156, as are virtually all of the internal parts. However, on the side here, on this scope mounting block, it's numbered 676. So I don't know if somehow this is a separate piece, which it really isn't. This is the main receiver. It seems odd that it would have, that all the other numbers would match, but this one wouldn't. Or perhaps this is a number for the optic that was put on it. I don't know. Um, that's just kind of a mystery. However, 
This lug was for a Zeiss prismatic optic, uh, a pretty cool early German scope. Of course, it doesn't come with this, uh, this rifle. In fact, I haven't actually seen one that I know of uh, in real life. There, the other sporter, number 152, that I'm aware of, had the exact same style of lug, although interestingly, 152 didn't have any number on this lug at all. Now, our lever here is actually the safety. This is the fire position, and when you snap it back, it's in the safe position. Interestingly, you cannot simply push it off of safe. You have to actually lift it up and push forward. This lug has an angled surface and a flat surface, so it'll snap into safe, but you have to deliberately put it back into the fire position, which is not necessarily a bad idea. Now, magazine changing on these uh, Mauser self-loading rifles is kind of interesting. You, we have a, a regular magazine catch here, and you'd think you'd push that and pull the magazine. You don't quite. What you actually do is push this and then pull out the trigger guard. That trigger guard acts as the magazine catch. Here is the magazine. Now, this one, I'm not sure. That it, if this is a 9 by 57 and just a, an 8 millimeter Mauser necked up to 9, uh, then this is almost certainly a standard uh, pattern magazine. If the cartridge is something different, they may have modified this magazine. The standard military version of this gun actually used the MG13 magazine. Those two are identical and interchangeable. So uh, that would have been a 25 round magazine. This one is three or four, maybe five rounds because it's a sporting rifle. Now these work through a rather strange inertial locking system. So let me take the top cover off to show you. We pull this tab out and then the top cover lifts off. So the way this works is that the locking flaps come in like this when the gun's locked and ready to fire. They, in that position, prevent the bolt from moving backwards. When you fire, you have this spring-loaded plate. This is sitting on the gun like this, and the recoil from firing causes the receiver, which is physically connected to this, to push backwards. Because of, basically, Newton's laws, this, uh, this camming plate uh, it wants to stay right where it is. It doesn't want to move. So it will sit in position, and the rest of the gun recoils around it, which causes it to move forward relative to the rest of the gun. In fact, if we move it all the way forward, we can lock it in position here. Now you've got these two cams. So when this is rearward, the front part of the cams, where they're close together, hold, they, they sit on these rollers, and they hold the flaps in place. When the gun fires into this position, the cam plate moves forward. That forces the rollers to push outward. And now in this position, they don't block the bolt, and now it can cycle backwards. Extremely smooth action, by the way. Very cool. Uh, not surprising for an early pattern, uh, low production Mauser self-loader like this, but just a pleasure to operate. Now there's one little additional feature here. In order to open the rifle manually, you have to push this plate forward. And that's why it has a little spring catch, which I've engaged right now. You push this plate forward until it clicks. Then you can open the bolt. However, there is a little slot in the bolt right there, which works in conjunction with this little tooth. So when you start to pull the bolt back, it'll open. But then it depresses this which releases this camming plate and, and allows it to snap backward. That means you get to open the bolt once, and then it automatically locks when you let it close. So you'd close it, those cams would come in and lock. That prevents you from snapping the plate forward and then unintentionally firing the gun when it's unlocked, which would be a bad thing. The one other interesting feature here is when you engage the safety, which, by the way, you cannot do with the gun unlocked, put the, the plates together, engage the safety, and now this flap is locked in place. It cannot move, which means you can't run this plate, you can't open the bolt. The safety locks the bolt closed as well. And the way it does that, you can see there's a little slot down in there. When you engage the safety, a hook comes up through there and enters into the bottom of this locking flap, which, by the way, I can pull one of these out to show you. Anyway, it locks that flap in place, uh, prevents it from moving. So there's what the locking flap looks like. You can see, of course, all of the other 156 numbers in here on the plate, on the top cover, this little guy, both of the locking flaps, the rear piece, the bolt, everything in this gun is 156. 
So what that 676 number on the, uh, the optics rail means, I really don't know. So in practice, that manual of arms would be to grab this plate here, snap it forward, then we can lock, we can pull the bolt back, we'll lock open on an empty magazine, and then when it goes forward, this plate snaps back into position. The bolt doesn't move, so to do it again, we have to snap the bolt forward again. There we go. Lock. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. There are, I think, even fewer of these sporting uh, model Mauser self-loaders than there are the military ones, and those military ones are extremely scarce to begin with. So, uh, pretty cool to see how this, you know, even 100 years ago, just like today, you get rifles that are made for the military and get the exact same rifle made for the civilian sporting market. Well, it was no different 100 years ago. Uh, Mauser was looking for a military contract, but happy to sell you a sporting rifle, change the caliber a little bit, make it a bigger caliber, more effective on uh, game, and there you go. Pretty fancy thing. Really be the only guy on your block to have such a thing. Uh, I guess if you would like to be the only guy on your block today to have one of these, take a look at the description text below. The link there will send you to Rock Island's catalog page on this rifle because, of course, it's coming up for sale. So you can take a look at their pictures and their description and uh, come up here to Rock Island and participate in the auction live or place a bit online. Thanks for watching.